On behalf of the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, welcome to today's training, TPH Risk Evaluation at Petroleum Contaminated Sites. My name is Mary Yelkin. I'm coming to you from Lincoln, Nebraska. I will serve as your moderator today. I will cover some introductory materials and help you have a better understanding of how you can actively participate today. And then I'll turn it over to our ITRC trainers. Today's training is based off a recently released technical and regulatory guidance document entitled TPH Risk Evaluation at Petroleum Contaminated Sites. That is an online document, and we hope that as you participate in today's training and learn more about that guidance document, it will become a resource for you as you are working on TPH sites. Today's training is sponsored by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or ITRC, and is hosted by the U.S. EPA Cleanup Information Network, or CLUIN. A few housekeeping items as we get started. Today's training is being recorded so that we will be able to provide an archive of this event for future ITRC customers. Also, the trainers will be in control of the slides as we move through today's presentation. If you are someone who would like to control your own slides or would like to have a copy of the slides for future reference, you can download a copy of the slides from that initial training page you were directed to. You can also access that in the related links section by clicking on training page and then click browse too. Throughout today's session, we would like to hear from you, both your questions and your feedback. We'll take two question and answer breaks, one about midway through and the other at the end of today's session. At any time today, you can submit your written questions in that question and answer or the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We will try to get to as many of those by responding verbally during our designated question and answer breaks as possible. However, we will ask our trainers also to respond uh, written back to those who are submitting comments and responding back individually to those people. We will do our best to get as many responses back to you as possible. Also, we'd like to hear back from everybody on how the training went for you today, any recommendations you have for improvement. And there's an online feedback form you can complete at the end of today's session. If you're someone who needs continuing education documentation, you can fill out that feedback form. There's a box at the end of that form to certify you participated today. Once you click on that box and submit, then you will have a certificate of participation generated for you. The Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council is hosted by the Environmental Council of States, and we're a network of state regulators working alongside our federal partners, being Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and the Environmental Protection Agency. In addition, we work with our industry affiliates program members, academia, and community stakeholders. All these groups come together to develop technical and regulatory guidance documents, training such as the one that you're participating on today, as a way to help people make better decisions when they're considering work at environmental sites. The full ITRC disclaimer is available on the ITRC website. If you do plan to use ITRC materials, we ask that you review the ITRC usage policy and credit ITRC. ITRC is partially funded by the U.S. government, ITRC nor the U.S. government warranty material or endorse specific products. ITRC has a variety of guidance documents, online training, as well as classroom training available. So to learn the latest about ITRC, please visit the website. If you would like to learn more about our trainers for today's session, there are bios available on that initial training page you are directed to. There's also a link to their bios at the end of this slide. First, we'll be hearing from Jennifer Strauss. She is with the Colorado Division of Oil and Public Safety. We will also be hearing from Monty Nagaya with Langen, Rachel Moeller with Chevron, Ross Steenson with the California Regional Water Quality Board, Diana Marquez with Burns & McDonald, Usha Vettigari with AECOM, and Jeff Kuhn, formerly with the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. We're very pleased to have these volunteer trainers be with us today, and we very much appreciate their work over the years with ITRC, all coming together to bring us this guidance document and the training you're about to participate on. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer Strauss with the Colorado Division of Oil and Public Safety on slide number six. Jennifer? Thank you, Mary. Welcome, everybody, to today's training. 
This online ITRC guidance document provides the current science for evaluating TPH risk at petroleum contaminated sites to assist decision makers in developing and implementing a technically defensible approach. As a state regulator, I'm particularly interested in this document because I'd like to determine if Colorado should evaluate the soil TPH standard that we have and also determine if Colorado needs a TPH groundwater standard. We hope that this um, guidance document will assist practitioners in the assessment of fate, transport, exposure, and toxicity of TPH. And we hope you gain information that may be used in conjunction with classic tiered approaches for risk-based decision making, such as the ASTM standard that was last updated in 2015. We have a roadmap of today's topics we will cover in this training. First, I'm going to go over why to use the TPH risk guidance. Then Mani Nagaya will discuss TPH composition, followed by Rachel Muller, who will discuss selecting the appropriate TPH lab analytical methods. We'll have our first question and answer session then. Um, following the first question and answer session, Ross Steenson will discuss how weathering changes TPH composition. And then Diana Marquez will discuss the heart of the document, which is assessing human and ecological risk. Usha Vedagari will then discuss the consideration of stakeholders' points of view. And Jeff Kuhn will wrap up before we have another question and answer session. Um, this is going to include poll questions and a case study throughout the training today. But first, let's discuss why the TPH risk guidance was developed. The purpose of this guidance is to assist in assessing TPH risk at petroleum contaminated sites. Since there's such an inconsistency of TPH standards across the states, we wanted to create guidance on the best practices to use to evaluate TPH risk. We developed this guidance so that other regulators have something to follow. So what is the risk of product in addition to benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes, as well as polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons? Are you underestimating risk using your current approach? These are some questions we hope the guidance will answer for you. TPH is a great way to identify petroleum contamination because it identifies a large range of petroleum compounds. Our team came up with a list of overarching learning objectives for you to attain knowledge on and apply towards evaluating TPH risk at sites. After participating in this training, we first hope that you recognize the ITRC document as a go-to resource for evaluating TPH risk. Second, we hope you recognize how TPH can change over time. And third, we hope you can select the appropriate analytical methods to match site objectives. Lastly, we hope you can apply the decision process to determine when a site-specific target level may be more appropriate than a generic screening level for TPH. The regulatory framework will determine how each exposure pathway must be evaluated for TPH risk. For example, some states prioritize soil leaching the groundwater concerns, while other states may prioritize groundwater discharging the surface water. Even within the same state, the priorities may vary. So know the regulatory agency that is going to make determinations. The historical approach for managing petroleum was the cleanup to non-detect concentrations. This was found to be technically and or economically infeasible in some cases. It was found that risk could still be reduced to receptors by eliminating complete or potentially complete exposure pathways to a point of exposure. Money and time could be saved using risk reduction or elimination. Chapter 3 of the guidance document discusses the federal and state regulations and statutes that are used during the assessment and cleanup of TPH. Um, it does include re uh, discussing regulatory challenges. For example, for states that do have TPH standards, they may be broken down in different ways depending on the toxicological data at the time. There may be different screening levels and cleanup goals in both surface water and groundwater media. From a time to time, states tend to get um, nuisance issues c coming in, and TPH data can be very useful if nuisance conditions are the driving factor. 
All factory nuisance conditions are the most common nuisance associated with petroleum cleanup sites. While occasionally there's visual or contact nuisance conditions associated with petroleum seeps and taste nuisance associated with TPH contaminated drinking water. This guidance provides options to navigate those challenges. As of September of 2017, 38 states plus Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico have approved UST programs. To determine which office regulates tanks, see the list of state contacts at the EPA website. The oily goop may end up in different media. This guidance will help everyone to understand the composition of TPH. Regulators will know which analyses to perform and develop skill in interpreting the results. Project managers who may have questions about TPH at their site could find the answers here and even discover that they are missing a part of TPH risk. Industry can even benefit from this guidance by understanding what services a consultant will provide to bring their event to closure. There's a wide variety of stakeholders who could be concerned with TPH risk. One challenge is explaining a range of compounds rather than one chemical. It comes with complexity that you don't often have with individual compounds. You need to be able to explain the range of compounds found in TPH and how those ranges change over time and space. TPH can be used to attempt to quantify something that is observed by its old odor so stakeholders can use the tools developed in this guidance, such as leading or attending community advisory groups, reading TPH risk fact sheets included in the guidance, and attending meetings throughout the site characterization and corrective action processes. TPH assessment is going to be similar to an assessment of any other contaminant. Reading through the guidance will take you through several topics. The blue rectangles will show typical stages of a TPH contaminated site project. First, we discuss how emergency act response actions that can be taken to mitigate TPH risks. Then we discuss the first steps of what data to collect for the initial investigation. Once the data is evaluated, it can be incorporated into the initial or preliminary conceptual site model. Risk calculators included in this guidance can be used for fate and transport evaluation, as well as developing appropriate cleanup goals. There are chapters devoted to risk assessment and spe special considerations of it. But the last part of the process flow diagram here shows that the ITRC LNAPL update and institutional controls guidance will help guide the rest of the decision making process until closure can be achieved. The large double-ended light blue arrows show processes that occur through multiple stages of the project. When you see the blue bar on the side of the slide, um, it will highlight our discussions about the case study we will introduce in this training. You're going to see a case study throughout today's training about a former fuel bulk terminal plant that was commercially redeveloped. This case study is important because TPH data was used to evaluate specific risks at that property. This case study will help you know when to consider TPH analysis for your site. In this case, a suitable approach was used to assess human health and ecological risk, and that's why the TPH screening levels used help to determine what media pose a risk to the surrounding area as well as on-site workers. Stakeholders were involved several years before the redevelopment process began. Petroleum products are complex mixtures. This is a generalized conceptual image to illustrate the different classes of contaminants that may be detected at petroleum release sites. But the makeup for specific sites will be different from what is shown in this figure. The contamination at petroleum release sites is likely to be comprised of a mixture of the original petroleum hydrocarbon compounds, petroleum-related degradation products, and fuel additives. People tend to think the blue bubble showing the individual petroleum constituents is the only part of risk to assess. But as you can see, there's more to TPH than just the indicator compounds. So are you reviewing the chromatograms and determining fractionated compounds in your analyses currently? Are the chromatograms changing over time and space? 
Did you select the appropriate TPH analytical methods based on your data quality objectives? We hope you recognize the ITRC document as a go-to resource for evaluating TPH risk at petroleum-contaminated sites and how it can provide a decision process to determine when a site-specific target level may be more appropriate than the generic screening level for TPH. I'd like to now introduce Mani Nagaya of Langan Engineering and Environmental Services Phoenix, Arizona office, who co-authored the Hawaii Department of Health case studies and will introduce us to TPH composition. Thank you, Jennifer. Can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully they do. Yes. Morning, everyone, or afternoon, where you guys are. Let's learn what TPH is in this portion of the webinar. Here's a visual that hopefully is not giving nightmares to like anyone out there. The terms used by the various states and EPH is a veritable alphabet soup. It includes some of the older terms such as GRO and DRO, which is gasoline range organics and diesel range organics, and some of the newer terms such as EPH, which is extractable petroleum hydrocarbons. The new ITRC TPH guidance will help you explain some of these terms, basically navigate some of these terms, and help you do a solid risk evaluation. Here are the learning objectives for today's portion of the webinar. We'll understand what TPH is, sources, composition, constituents, and key properties that make it unique. We'll learn a little bit about bulk TPH methods and associated challenges. We'll use the case study that Jennifer just introduced and speak about some of these preliminary conceptual site model considerations. And we'll wrap things up with some common pitfalls and considerations for CSM development. TPH, where does it come from? Crude oil and individual refinery products are typically characterized as TPH in the environmental media. Crude oil is essentially primarily consisting of carbon and hydrogen, and it also includes some heteroatoms, you know, things like replacement atoms such as nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen, and it also includes some impurities such as metals. What are you looking at right now is a, is a simple schematic on, on the refining process, which is essentially uh, a distillation and conversion process, whereby crude oil is boiled and distillation cuts are taken at different temperatures, which then yields commercial products such as gasoline, kerosene, and so on and so forth. Currently, there are specifications for about 2,000 refinery products. Our focus is on TPH, and TPH in general includes a carbon range of C5 through C44. So what is your typical TPH release site? As you can see from this visual here, it can, like, the exposure to TPH in the environment by humans, plants, and animals can occur everywhere throughout the life cycle of crude oil processing, from the oil wells through the refineries all the way to your local gas stations. Most, like, more recently, the typical like, TPH release site is probably associated with brownfield redevelopment. And that probably also begs the obvious question, is it an El Napo site? And the answer is yes. When TPH is, like, is detected in the environment, El Napo is not too far away. As uh, Jennifer was mentioning early on, the El Napo update came out in 2018, and folks are encouraged to look at that training as well. For today's presentation, El Napo and TPH are often two sides of the same coin. So let's look at some of the TPH constituents and key properties next. Hydrocarbons can be broadly classified as as aliphatics and aromatics. Aliphatics are, prob are almost always straight, branched, or cyclic, for example, cycloalkanes. And aromatics, on the other hand, have a ring structure with conjugated bonds, the most common being benzene and the 17 EPA PAHs. In terms of properties that are relevant for a risk evaluation, it is important to understand that aliphatics are nonpolar and have low water solubility. Aromatics, on the other hand, have some polarity and have increased solubility in water. I'm sure most practitioners in the audience would have probably encountered benz like benzene in the dissolved phase if you're dealing with a gasoline release, and this kind of speaks to that aspect of things. So what is in that petroleum release? Here's a visual from the guidance <coughs> where we're showing like products and, and, and carbon ranges. As you can see, Products are mixtures of hydrocarbons, and the common fuel types overlap in carbon ranges. For example, if you take gasoline, 
and also like naphthalene or any of these things, they overlap in carbon ranges. And no method, bulk or speciated, would be able to differentiate what's in there. So in terms of risk, if you have an understanding of the hydrocarbon constituents, it does not matter what source you're dealing with, generally speaking. So the bottom line message here is that bulk TPH analysis is not composition specific and products overlap in carbon ranges. Let's dwell into this topic a little bit further. What you're looking at is bulk TPH data in soil from uh, the same site using EPA method 8015, which is a classic TPH uh, bulk method. The visual here is poor, I'm sorry about that. But the x-axis here represents elution time and carbon number, and the y-axis represents relative concentration. In this case, the reported concentration, which is 15,000 ppm, which is basically a counting of peaks exercise, tells us that the source is actually from three different types of petroleum, gasoline, diesel, and South Louisiana crude. And those three different sources also have like dissimilar fractions due to weathering process. So obviously, these considerations represent different risks, and it is important to understand these things. At this stage, we are ready to define what TPH is. TPH is a quantitative value in a sample, and that sample could be soil, sediment, water, or air, and that is predicated by the analytical method, which varies from state to state and lab to lab, like the alphabet soup that we talked about or, or looked at earlier. The TPH data that you receive from the lab is essentially the known or assumed aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbon concentration that is either originally released into the environment or that remains after the process of weathering. And the most important consideration is that it is not necessarily total, it's not necessarily all from petroleum, and it's not necessarily all hydrocarbons. So how do we deal with this conundrum? As you can see, the most important thing with like, evaluating TPH data is to have a, a solid conceptual site model. It is important to develop a preliminary model and also like, update it over time and fit your site to your local regulatory framework at, a, at the state and local level. And that will probably help you do the right things and assess properly. So let's look, look at some of the e TPH evaluation challenges again one more time. We've already established that weathering happens and composition changes over time and space. We already also established that, that it's impractical to analyze hundreds of individual compounds towards the, right, because of the concept of isomerism. Although we have come a long way since the TPH criteria working group like days in the 1990s, there is still a limitation of toxicity data. So what do we do with this? Here comes the evolution of fractionation. It is simply the process of differentiating aliphatic and aromatic portion of TPH, either instrumentally or chemically. It is basically a group, like grouping of aliphatic and aromatic compounds, generally up, up to a, a range of C44, in which certain carbon ranges having similar characteristics are assigned. And, and risk is like, estimated based on that. The fraction approach is the key link to relating TPH composition in the different media with risk. Ross and Rachel will be covering these topics in much detail later on in this book, like in this webinar today. Let's circle back to the case study that Jennifer just introduced. Here we're looking at the preliminary conceptual site model consideration. Again, this photo is also not that great. I want to point out a few items here. So we already talked about an like an AST farm, so this location was the, uh, was the area of the former gasoline AST tanks. The background here is the location of the jet fuel and diesel pipelines. Hopefully you can see that blue swath of water there, that's like a nearby harbor. In fact, there was a, like a surface water and storm water discharge directly from this farm, like directly into the, into the water body. As you can imagine, all environmental media were impacted, and that includes soil to soil gas with groundwater and surface water in between. The one highlight about this project that we wanted to highlight here, obviously we are in a very urban setting in the middle of a big metro. And so everyone's very curious on what's going on at this site as the redevelopment was happening. Both stakeholders, in this case the redevelopment company and the owners and tenants were actively engaged and they were informed when sampling was occurring and the data was shared with everyone. Usha Vedagri, as Jennifer mentioned, will, will tackle the stakeholder topic later on in this presentation. 
We need to wrap things up for this portion of the webinar. We polled the work group early on on how they were dealing with TPH release sites, and, and here's some of the common themes that came about. There's a huge reliance on indicator components, things like BTEX and PAHS for CSM development, and also for risk, also for risk evaluation. The problem with that is that look, most of the toxic fractions still remain, even after the indicator components are gone. So collecting samples for both fractions and indicator compounds is recommended. And even up till this date, you know, CSMs are developed just for human direct exposure, and peripheral pathways are not considered, and that can lead to underestimation of risk. Your CSM can help you guide the like, decisions in the right direction. Also, revising the CSM over time will help you document the changes in the plume and identify pockets of residual contamination. TPH, especially in brownfield redevelopment site and residual contamination, goes hand in hand, not just for the, like the decision making, but also after post-closure, as, as many of you can appreciate. There is also an incon like incorrect consideration for natural degradation data. Because petroleum will degrade over time, maybe it will take years and decades, unlike chlorinated compounds, it is very important for collecting data that includes metabolites, which are like basically biodegradation byproducts. Uh, we'll tackle this topic later on. To wrap things up, um, we also need to consider residual contamination and stakeholder engagement. Let's do a quick knowledge check. Mary, if you could please open up the poll. So what is TPH? Is TPH defined by the analytical method? Is TPH an accurate measure of total hydrocarbons? Does TPH concentration include biodegradation products and metabolites, or is it none of the above? The answers are trickling in. I'm really happy to see the answers that are coming in. As most of you are answering in this poll, TPH is defined by the analytical method, and that's an important take-home message. It varies from state to state and lab to lab. Mary, if you could close the poll. Thank you, everyone. Now I have the honor of introducing Dr. Rachel Moeller. She's with Chevron in San Ramon, California. She has a PhD in lab chromatography, and she's the technical team lead in Chevron. So. I hope you'll be glad to hear from Rachel. Rachel, if you're there, please take it away. Thank you, Manny. So as Manny mentioned, um, TPH it a, can be a complex mixture, and it can be composed of both aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbons, and it varies by carbon number. So um, because of this, it's very important to have a basic understanding of how this TPH number was calculated so that these TPH values that you obtain um, are not misused to draw erroneous conclusions about the site. So TPH, um, it's defined by the analytical me measurement, and after this training and the use of the guidance document, um, each of you should be able to select the best analytical method based on your data quality objectives, uh, properly interpret your analytical results, as well as recognize when the results are questionable. TPH um, is a method-defined parameter, and since no method can do everything, you should consider the following items listed in green here in order to um, select the most appropriate method. So questions you should be asking yourself before you submit a sample to the lab um, are what is your data quality objective? What's your application? Um, these two objectives would require different um, and local methods. Also, uh, certain methods should not be applied to, to every media. So again, I want to emphasize that TPH is defined by the analytical method used to measure, and results should be reviews, reviewed within the context of the underlying characterization and risk evaluation. So because the, uh, the hydrocarbon mixture um, varies uh, by carbon number and composition, uh, the preferred laboratory method uh, uses some, is some form of gas chromatography. So as the name of the technique suggests, this instrument separates molecules in the gas phase to better understand 
um, by volatility or a carbon number uh, what's present in your complex mixture. So there are a variety of TPH analytical methods that are based on analysis by GC, and we're going to describe a few of them here. So if you have a choice on what TPH method to use at a site, uh, here's a brief summary of the TPH methods for water and soil matrices. Bulk TPH methods, such as EPA methods 8015 or 8260, or um, some state methods, such as Texas 1005, they're designed for site assessment, determination of the extent of impacts, or quantification of total extractable organics. These methods should be used for pretty much every sample that you collect across the site. But because it's difficult to evaluate risk for as varied a mixture as TPH, many states have turned to uh, methods that separate the sample into fractions and by carbon number. So in order to better understand the fate and transport or risk, these fractionation methods are frequently applied to only a small percentage of the samples to better understand um, hot areas or areas of higher uncertainty. So typical methods um, such as the Texas 1006 or the Massachusetts VPH, EPH or the Washington Department of Ecology method uh, should be used in this case. So I'll describe more about what these methods are in on some upcoming slides. So if if you're only interested in hydrocarbons and not total extractable organics or metabolites, uh, EPA method 3630C followed by some bulk TPH method is what should be used. So additional details on the analytical met methods can be found in Table 5.4 of the guidance document or the 2016 ZMO API white paper um, that the reference is shown at the bottom of the slide. So if you're still um, uncertain about what TPH method to use, I encourage you to talk to the chemist in, in the lab or your risk assessor. So let's go into a little more detail about the method to be used if you're only interested in the petroleum hydrocarbons. The so EPA method 3630C um, describes the use of silica gel to remove polar non-petroleum -hydro, non hydrocarbons and um, as well as any potentially uh, naturally occurring compounds from the analysis. So the silica gel cleanup results in a hydrocarbon only sample that can be analyzed for bulk TPH. So the result from this analysis is, a TP, is one TPH number without polars or non-hydrocarbon interferences. So on the right here, I've shown a picture of a uh, silica gel column. And the silica gel in this column is it's simply a fine-grained version of the material that's found in various new items, such as shoes or suitcases, to remove water. And it's used to separate the hydrocarbons from the non-hydrocarbons. So there are a variety of cleanup options, but the column cleanup is the most effective cleanup method, um, and a lab surrogate, whenever this technique is used, a lab surrogate should be used to ensure that the silica gel efficiently retains the non-hydrocarbons while allowing the, um, the, the petroleum hydrocarbons to pass through. So the silica gel cleanup is part of making sure, um, of ensuring that your, your site conceptual model is correct. Um, silica gel cleanup is frequently used uh, in the determination of the extent of hydrocarbon impact, the locations of biodegradation, um, as well as to better understand where to perform active remediation. And it should be noted that uh, currently there are no cleanup methods for uh, the gasoline range material or um, air phase samples. So now let's take a look at the fractionation methods um, that are used for risk assessment and fate and transport purposes. So here, um, silica gel is not used to clean up the sample, but instead to separate the sample into your saturates and your aromatics fraction to help answer questions um, 
that are shown in the cloud on the right. So the saturates and aromatics fractions are then, that are collected off the silica gel column are then injected into a GC to obtain information on equivalent carbon ranges. So if you're reviewing fractionation data, um, one thing that you should be sure to check is, the, is what, carbon, um, what carbon ranges uh, are being used for the analysis because these carbon ranges can vary um, depending on where your site's located and the governing agency. So fractionation can be applied to all matrices, so it can be applied to NAPO, soil, water, gas, um, but it's not typically recommended for water because there have been a number of studies um, where um, they've looked at the water um, that allowed us to easily predict the hydrocarbons in the water phase. So we know that, for instance, C19 aliphatic, aliphatics um, or uh, C30 aromatics, they're not going to be soluble in water. So I encourage you to refer to the fact sheet and the guidance uh, for additional information. So although these fractionation methods, um, they can provide detailed, useful information, they do cost more than bulk TPH, so typically they're two to five times more expensive. Um, they will remove non-hydrocarbons from the analysis, and there can, be a, there can be raised reporting limits depending on what fractionation method you use. So now let's take a look at how these um, analytical methods were applied to our case study. So in our case study, um, the area of the most uncertainty and the area of more concern was around, um, shown by the rectangle in the background, so around the formal, former diesel and jet fuel area because they're interested in knowing what will discharge into the harbor. So, um, they collected, so at this site, they collected bulk TPH, um, both for the soil and the groundwater across the site. Um, however, they went one step further um, for the groundwater um, around the diesel release because, so they collected the groundwater, they generated TPH data with and without silica gel cleanup to determine areas where the l apple was heavily degraded and likely dominated by the these TPH re related metabolites. And they really did this to assess the biodegradation state, as well as gain an understanding of what could, what could be discharging into the nearby harbor. They also collected fractionation data um, to determine the carbon range of the soil vapors uh, around the diesel release. But this fractionation uh, data was only collected at a couple of the wells with the highest uncertainty. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk um, briefly about data interpretation. So the, the reason that we, the preferred method, TPH method, is GC-based is because you get to review chromatograms. And so these chromatograms, they're, they're more than just pretty pictures. Um, these pictures are what's integrated to yield the TPH values and are what ends they can provide all the um, information that's listed in green here on the slide. So on the right, I've shown two chromatograms collected from the same well, but at different times. So when you're looking at chromatograms, as you move from the left to the right, the carbon number increases. So and for these samples, um, as I've shown, the carbon numbers range from C11 to C23. So if the sample is relatively unweathered, a picket fence pattern will stand out as shown by the red asterisk in the upper plot, in the upper chromatogram. This pattern um, is not present in the lower chromatogram, and this gives, indicates that significant weathering has occurred at the site. On the next couple of slides, I'd like to demonstrate how these chromatograms can be used to interpret what is being quantified as TPH. So in the example presented here, um, it was a common problem because historically at corner strip malls, responsible parties were required to run um, two different analyses, one for, TP, one for TPH and one for solvents. So they used 8015 to analyze for hydrocarbons and 8260 to look for solvents. So folks ended up chasing phantom gasoline at some sites because 
these solvents will be quantified as TPH. Um, so remember that TPH is not always total, it's not only petroleum, and it's not only hydrocarbons. So a review of the chromatograms can be extremely important. So um, in, this, in this example, the agency said that there was a gasoline plume based on the 8015 TPH results. So if you look at the upper plot, this is a gasoline standard, and this is what you would expect if you find if, if there's a gasoline release present at your site. Since gasoline is a complex mixture of um, over 300 compounds, one would expect to see a complex chromatogram with, with a lot of peaks. Um, and this is exactly what you see. However, um, at the site, if you looked at the chromatogram um, that was obtained from a well at the site, it essentially only contained four peaks. So if you only see a few peaks in your chromatogram, um, you should be highly skeptical that the GC is actually detecting the presence of hydrocarbons. So in this case, a uh, GC mass spec confirmed that the peaks were chlorinated compounds and not just hydrocarbons. So chlorinated compounds, um, they will or they can be extracted and quantified as TPH. So in this in this second example, a site was um, being held open because of the presence of what was thought as TPHD in the groundwater. So the lab, the lab reported a TPHD value of 2.3 milligrams per liter. So a quick review of the chromatograms reveals that there are multiple spikes in the chromatogram, as well as a big hump. So you get these multiple spikes, and then you get this large hump. So there are a couple of red flags um, indicating that the sample might not be, that this analysis might not be measuring hydrocarbons. So the dead giveaway is the hump, um, and the more subtle indicator is the presence of these discrete peaks or these spikes um, that are not in a repeating pattern. So the hump, the reason the hump is a dead giveaway is because it's centered around the internal standard, and the internal standards are typically C19 aromatic compounds, uh, and you wouldn't expect compounds in this carbon range to be very soluble in water. So the silica gel cleanup uh, in the insert here shows that following silica gel cleanup, um, that the 8015 TPHD concentration lowered down to non-detect. So let's get re energized by answering a poll question. Um, what do you all think? True or false or you're not sure? All US EPA method 8015 results are directly comparable regardless of the lab. OK, very good. So most of you are responding with false. And that is correct because um, the 8015 analysis, it depends on a number of parameters, some of which I've shown here. So it depends on what extraction solvent you use to um, extract the hydrocarbons from your water. It also depends on the carbon ranges that are integrated. So for some um, areas, C6 to C10 is what's used for gasoline range. In other areas, it might be C6 to C12. So if, um, if, it's, if you suddenly get a difference in TPH value, uh, if it suddenly increases or decreases, don't assume a change has occurred at the site. Go in and, and try to figure out how the analysis was actually performed. So before I leave the analytical method section, um, I would like to reiterate the importance of understanding the TPH method. So here, um, it was the, in the bar chart, um, I've shown four different TPH methods. And um, on the y-axis, you get the concentration in PPM. And so you can see that um, these bars for each of um, they don't agree. So the, your TPH va value can vary significantly depending on what method you use. Um, and not only are these results different for the various methods, um, but if you look at the x-axis, we're actually measuring um, 
non-petroleum hydrocarbons um, here. So if your results don't make sense, I encourage you to dig into the data a little and review the chromatograms as well as the site conditions um, that could potentially point to naturally occurring compounds. And so I would like to conclude by briefly mentioning the field methods. Um, so these methods, they can provide valuable information during initial field screening, plume delineation, and while well, excavation is open and ongoing. So a more in-depth description of the pros and cons of these methods can be found in Appendix D of the guidance document. Um, and because of the poor precision of these methods, uh, laboratory results should be used to confirm your conclusions. All right, thanks, Rachel. We do now have time for questions and answers. You're welcome to type your questions in in the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And also, in a moment, I'll give our phone line audience a time to ask their questions out loud if they would like to do so. And just a reminder for those on the phone line audience, if you would like to ask a question out loud, it is pound six to unmute. Also a reminder for those who may need continuing education documentation, for example, a certificate of participation, if you fill out the feedback form at the end of today's training, there's a box to click at the end of that form to certify you participated today. Once you click Submit, a certificate of participation will be generated for you. I'd like to now go to our phone lines. If you have a question for our trainers, please go ahead and speak up now and ask that question out loud. All right, we'll move on to some of our written questions. It says, if after silica gel cleanup, the chromatogram still has the UCM hump, is that possible to quantify the UCM hump only? So in, in that case, um, if, the, if you still get a UCM hump after silica gel, I would go back and look at um, what type of silica gel cleanup method was used. So as I mentioned, there are different types of silica gel cleanup, um, but the column cleanup is the most effective. Uh, so, and I would, my first inclination would be that your cleanup wasn't effective if you're still seeing that hump around your internal standard peak. But they can still, but they can't, they can still integrate that peak or that hump. Or there, or there could potentially be some oil in the sample. All right, thanks, Rachel. Uh, next question says, in regions where TPH concentrations are not regulated, is there value in analyzing TPH and assessing the method you discuss? And maybe one of our regulators might want to take that one. Hi, this is Ross. Um, and to answer that question really depends on how accurately you want to measure or estimate risk. Um, so the best way to do uh, estimate risk using hydrocarbons mixture releases is to use the fra a fraction approach. All right, since we're on a regulatory topic here, we're going to move on to another question along those lines. Um, it's basically this person is saying that they've encountered a regulatory agency that discourages the use of silica gel cleanup, and they're wondering what situations and procedures would you use to justify the use of silica gel cleanup? Okay, this is Ross. I'll try taking that question. Uh, again, it, it depends on what question you're trying to answer. So if they, and whether they're concerned about the metabolites, if they're not concerned about the metabolites, that makes it easy and you could only, you know, you could use the, the justification that you're removing the non-hydrocarbons and therefore just use TPH with the silica gel cleanup. Our agency now has screening levels for metabolites <clears throat> separate and so we want it analyzed with 
uh, silica gel cleanup so we get the hydrocarbons only and then separately without silica gel cleanup so we get the metabolites and then we deal with uh, background estimation separately. So it depends uh, on the question that the agency, you know, what that agency is concerned about um, to, as to what kind of angle you're going to take for, for justifying the use. All right, Rachel, these next couple questions referring to your section, I'm going to take us back to slide number 36, so bear with me while I get back to that one. And the question is, um, could you please repeat what you said about weathering on slide 36? So it's, it's well known that um, we have weathering, so there's biodegradation, there's, there's a variety of me weathering mechanisms that can occur at your site. Um, and the use of chromatograms can, the chromatograms can be u easily used um, to identify um, how weathered your samples are. So in the upper chromatogram, um, if a sample is relatively unweathered, um, you'll get this picket fence, fence pattern. So where I've shown the, uh, that's denoted by the red asterisk. Um, and so in the, in the lower chromatogram, um, this is the same well um, a few years later, you can see that that picket fence pattern has disappeared, uh, which indicates that there has been significant significant weathering that has occurred at your site. All right, Rachel, we have a question related to slide 37, so we'll go ahead and advance to slide 37. It says, can you elaborate on how chlorinated constituents were identified? Yes. So, um, so the chlorinated um, solvents, they were actually identified using a GC connected to a mass spec detector. So the mass spectrometer has the um, benefit or the advantage that it can actually um, do a library search against what your um, mass spectrum you obtain from your sample, and that allows you to identify what the compound is. So the mass spec um, gives a unique fingerprint for, uh, for compounds that you can then go back and, and try to identify what those peaks are. All right, we're going to check in with our phone line audience again. If there's any questions for our trainers, please go ahead and speak up. All right, we'll go back to some written questions. Uh, this one says, what about groundwater samples? Didn't the presenter say fractionation is it, isn't appropriate for water? So how would you measure metabolites? Hi, this is Ross. The, the, currently, the best meth, method for analyzing for metabolites is are the extractable TPH methods without silica gel cleanup. And we'll cover a little bit of that in, in my presentation where I show an example chromatogram. Um, so there's, a, there's some efforts underway, some discussions uh, with some researchers about coming up with better methods. So we can do a lot more with the hydrocarbons only. We've got um, the better techniques. The TPH method is really can be optimized for hydrocarbons. You've got the fractionation methods. We're not in the same place with metabolites. All right, we sure appreciate all those questions and those answers. We are going to need to move on to the second portion of our presentation today. If we haven't gotten to your question yet, for those that have submitted written questions, we will ask our trainers to respond directly to you as we continue on through the second portion of our slides. I'll move us now forward to our next slide, which is going to be slide number 44. And at this point, I will turn it over to Ross Steenson with the San Francisco Regional Water Quality Board. Ross? Good morning, every, or hello, everyone. So what we're going to talk about in this section is how TPH composition changes after release to the environment. Um, and this is important because composition of TPH affects risk. 
Um, how we're going to do that, first we're going to cover how phys physical weathering changes the composition, and then we'll touch on how biological weathering um, also changes composition, but additionally can generate these intermediate products called met petroleum metabolites that can then be further degraded. Uh, this will help you be able to anticipate TPH composition changes throughout a site, and in the case of the hydrocarbons, it might help you decide where and when to fractionate your data. Taking you back to our tank farm example, here we have a cross-section. Um, you can see in the upper right we have our gasoline, former gasoline AST. And just to recall, there was a gasoline release and diesel release. Um, the extent has been defined using bulk TPH methods. And so what you're seeing in dark gray in the diagram is some gross contamination, which is really residual non-aqueous phase liquid or mobile non-aqueous phase liquid. You can see in the center um, that there's a dissolved plume moving to the left, consisting, and that plume consists of both hydrocarbons and metabolites. And then we have the concern of discharge to aquatic habitats um, off to the left, and um, uh, concerns about exposure to human receptors at the top. <clears throat> so here, remember, we're focusing on TPH composition. So one of the first things to keep in mind is where is the mass? So we've got these three pie charts. The size indicates relative amount of mass. Uh, black, the, you can see the colors are defined on the left. The black is the napple. So the majority of the mass is going to be in the napple in these gray shaded areas. Um, when we're looking in the vapor in the Vado zone, it's obviously going to be predominantly vapor, uh, but there's some other phases present and in the water. And so in the coming diagrams, we're going to look at how TPH composition changes um, through weathering, uh, both for the NAPL as well as the vapor and water phases. So uh, we're going to do this mainly by focusing on volatilization and dissolution, and then we're going to touch on uh, two uh, the obvious um, uh, types of biodegradation. There's a lot more in the document itself and would refer you to that for further uh, information on those topics. So first up here, we have partitioning from oil to vapor. So the way this graph reads is you've got boiling point uh, increasing to the right across the x-axis, similar to a chromatogram, and then vapor pressure increasing on the y-axis um, towards the top. And you can see the curve, just take a look at the curve. You can see it's all plotting nicely on one curve. We have different classes of hydrocarbons present, but with no point, no, uh, no need to focus on which ones are where. The, the takeaway from this is that um, vapor pressure is inversely uh, related to boiling point. So the larger the hydrocarbon, the higher the boiling point, the less the vapor pressure. So what's going to be in the TPH vapor? it's going to be those smaller compounds, smaller hydrocarbons. Moving on to partitioning from oil to water. This, you can see right off the bat, we have a, is a little bit more complicated. We have a similarly constructed diagram with a boiling point on the x-axis, aqueous solubility increasing on the y-axis. There's a similar pattern in that the lower boiling points um, have higher solubilities, but there's a class separation. And so um, if you look at the line on the chart on the right-hand side in blue, those are the aromatics. Those are relatively the most soluble. And the aliphatics, which have the dashed line on the left in green, are less soluble, much less soluble, maybe two to three orders of magnitude less than for a given uh, carbon size versus the aromatics. So the takeaway here is TPH water composition typically going to be dominated by the aromatics. Um, there are some intermediate classes um, uh, plotting in the center there between the two, and that's, those compounds will also be captured by the TPH analysis. So you, <clears throat> biodegradation. So hydrocarbons readily undergo biodegradation once released to the environment, particularly under aerobic conditions, much lower under anaerobic conditions. We looked at this chromatogram earlier during Rachel's portion of the, uh, the presentation. And the, the compounds at the top, um, the single peaks with the asterisks, are in alkanes. And so different hydrocarbons have different susceptibilities to 
biodegradation. It doesn't mean they won't be degra degraded, but some of them get, tend to get degraded first. And so the two diagrams are showing that we've, in this snapshot where we are at the end of the, um, <clears throat> the N alkanes have been lost and what we've got left are the highly branched alkanes, which will continue to degrade, but much more slowly. So something to keep in mind as biodegradation, biodegradation proceeds, metabolites are going to be generated. They in turn can be degraded. And we noticed that under anaerobic conditions, which is slow, um, otherwise we wouldn't have oil reservoirs, um, they're more prone to that condition, uh, that type of biodegradation is more prone to uh, build up of uh, petroleum metabolites, particularly near source areas. <clears throat> so what are the metabolites? They're intermediate biodegradation products of hydrocarbons. The molecules include oxygen, and they have different properties. So they're polar, uh, which leads to greater solubility. If you look at the table on the right, we have N-hexane and two of its uh, metabolites, 2-hexanone and uh, hexanoic acid. If you look at the column on the far right, you see that the solubility of those two metabolites is about three orders of magnitude greater than the uh, parent compound, N-hexane. And while you're at it, take a look in the center column under boiling, boiling point, and you'll see that hexanoic acid uh, is boiling uh, in the diesel range. So keep that in mind when you're looking at chromatograms and interpreting TPH data. So I think we covered this a little bit earlier under Rachel's presentation. Just a reminder, um, if you're using tractable TPH analyses without silica gel cleanup, um, that's most, that you can detect the metabolites at that point. Um, and uh, remember, we're always using multiple lines of evidence when we interpret TPH data. So there are different things you can use to identify metabolites. Here on the right, we have an example chromatogram of metabolite showing a, a, a kind of its characteristic, their characteristic hump um, that's straddling the latter portion of the diesel range and into the early portion of the motor oil range. Uh, other uh, lines of evidence for this particular sample is after silica gel, it was uh, non-detect. Uh, we have some concept of what you would expect for whether diesel's hydrocarbon solubility, and it's uh, lower than 3,000 micrograms per liter is detected in the sample. And also we happen to know that the sample is collected immediately down gradient of a release area. So um, those are some tools you can use for um, metabolite identification. <clears throat> All right, so Mani talked about the challenges of TPH risk evaluation because we have limited toxicity data and it's difficult to resolve all the individual uh, hydrocarbons, particularly once you're above about C8. So the TPH fractions are considered, with fractionation analytical methods, are considered the best approach for risk assessment of hydrocarbons. So what we're going to do in the coming slides is use TPH fractions to illustrate composition changes due to weathering and biodegradation. So the way you read these, we have two examples here. At the top, let's take a look at the TPH criteria working group 13 transport fractions. Um, and you can see across the x-axis, it's uh, increasing equivalent carbon numbers, so increasing carbon uh, size or compound size. The top row is aliphatics in green, and the bottom row is aromatics in blue. So the both diagrams are constructed similarly. And the way, this, um, the way they constructed these is there's about an order magnitude difference, uh, successive difference decrease going from left to right um, in volatility and solubility. So for example, looking at the EC5 to 6 aliphatic range on the far left, comparing that just kind of in the middle, uh, say EC16 to 21, they're about those compounds have about five orders of magnitude less mobility in terms of volatility and solubility. The grayed out um, fraction in the upper right is considered, you know, a couch potato essentially. It's non-volatile, non-soluble. Those are the large range um, aliphatics. On the bottom we have the EPA toxicity fractions. And uh, there's not as much toxicity data or they elected to assign toxicities using mixtures. And so we have these six fractions, low, air, low, medium, and high aliphatic, and low, medium, high aromatic. 
what we're going to do in the coming slides is use these six conceptual fractions, low, medium, high, or aliphatic, and aromatic, to illustrate these composition changes. First up, the most important thing affecting risk at a site is what mixture, what TPH mixture was released, or mixtures. So here we have compositions in unweathered uh, example, maples, uh, gasoline on the upper left, followed with diesel below, and then motor oil to the right. The way, let's take a look at the gasoline uh, graph. The way you read this across the um, x-axis, we have the low, aliphatic on the left, aromatic on the right, then the medium, again, with aliphatic on the left, aromatic on the right, and then the high, which there's no composition in the high range. The um, x-axis, or what, excuse me, the y-axis is mass fraction, relative mass fraction, so one at the top is 100%. Each diagram adds up to all the bars stacked up at up to uh, 100%. So you can see for gasoline, it's mainly um, uh, low aliphatic and aromatic fractions and a little bit of medium. In big contrast to that, you can see for the oil, uh, motor oil, that it's all, you know, 80% roughly aliphatics uh, and then about 20% aromatics. And diesel's kind of between the two of those. So weathering of NAPL actually has its own terminology. These last few years, it's known as natural source zone depletion. And ITRC's uh, LNAPL 3 document released last year has a really nice appendix describing that in detail. I would refer you to that. Things to keep in mind is uh, what happens to NAPL. The mobile hydrocarbons will partition out, whether they volatilize or dissolve. And the remaining uh, NAPL will be depleted of those uh, components, where biodegradation is happening, often around the edges, um, but can be, uh, if there's water in tra trapped water, it can be in, in the NAPL as well. Metabolites are going to be generated. So here, uh, back to our, um, our graphs of TPH fraction compositions. Here we have some weathered NAPL examples, um, and we've got the blue bar indicating the case study because, as you recall, uh, the compound, the mixtures released were gasoline and diesel. So we have gasoline on the left, unweathered at the top, the previous uh, same chart you saw earlier, and then weathered at the bottom, and then same pattern for, uh, for or same uh, sequencing for diesel. So taking a look at the uh, weathered gasoline uh, chart at the lower left, you can see that um, this at this stage of weathering, the uh, low uh, fractions, both aliphatic and aromatic, are completely depleted, and the remaining medium fractions have been enriched. Um, and so if you were using a fraction approach and you had assigned toxicity values, you might think to yourself, yeah, there's going to be, um, there's a different risk profile from exposure to this NAPL. On the left with the diesel, uh, versus the unweathered versus the weathered, you can see that in this particular snapshot, there just hasn't been that much weathering. And so the risk profile might be different. So again, composition affects risk. That's why we fractionate. Let's move on to vapor. On the left, we have our gasoline uh, and diesel fractions for near source TPH vapor concentrations. And you see uh, for gasoline, it's nearly all aliphatics. That's what you would expect in the vapors. You would all low-range aliphatics and some uh, uh, low-range aromatics. And, you know, much higher proportion than, say, the uh, for aliphatics than what was in the original NAPL. For diesel, it's similarly dominated despite the low composition in the, in, of the, the low aliphatic and aromatic ranges. That's what the vapor composition is dominated by. So something to keep in mind when it comes to vapor, TPH vapor attenuation, is that TPH vapors attenuate sharply um, in the presence of oxygen. So we have a, um, a cross section here on the right from ITRC's 2014 PVI guidance, and you have a NAPL smear zone at the bottom, uh, and then this could be, uh, we, I've seen this often within a few feet, two to three feet, orders of magnitude decreases in TPH vapor concentration. So they're often thin zones around NAPL areas. All right, let's move on to groundwater composition. 
here. So you might notice for, um, for those paying attention to the colors, you can see there's a lot of blue and a lot less uh, green from the previous side, slide. And so what's in the water is predominantly going to be those aromatic compounds. And so for gasoline, we see, again, it's dominated by the, the low-range um, aromatic, just a little bit of aliphatic, and then some medium-range um, aromatic. In the case of the diesel, there's just not that much in the first place in the low-range uh, fractions, and so it's all dominated by medium-range aromatics. The, um, so we all know that TPH plumes um, attenuate with uh, distance from the release. But they don't necessarily attenuate at the same rate as TPH vapor plumes. And so they, the TPH groundwater plumes can actually be on the order of um, you know, a few hundred feet. And since those plumes tend to be longer, we wanted to just give you an example or make you think about how that composition can change along the flow path. So here we have an area, maybe like our case study, with the um, a nap, you know, residual napple at the right. That's where the release happened. Groundwater is flowing to the left. We're showing you the kind of classic redox zonation sequence. And something to keep in mind is the TPH composition near the source is going to be different um, versus down gradient due to susceptibility to biodegradation, solubility, what's in the water, adsorption, other factors. So keep that in mind. So a TPH number from near the NAPL might not really mean the same thing from a risk profile at the downgrading extent. Lastly, I wanted to point out um, uh, just kind of the, the uh, contrast, the hydrocarbons versus the metabolites. So, the hydrocarbons are going to be highest concentration near the NAPL and decrease down gradient. More or less, it's going to be the same for the metabolites. However, um, right after the release, it's going to take a while before biodegradation gets underway enough to build up some concentrations of metabolites. But over time, the apex of the metabolite triangle should pull back towards the uh, NAPL source itself. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is the metabolites generally extend a bit further than uh, hydrocarbon plumes. We don't have any quantitative information on that now, but it's been observed, uh, you know, 100 feet, maybe more. So that brings us to um, quiz time. So this is a, one of those questions that's kind of a more likely situation. So our CSM is we've got a 30-year-old large diesel spill at a bulk plant. And just a reminder, diesel is EC8 to 26. So the question is, what soluble TPH fractions or petroleum-related compounds are more likely present in a groundwater sample downgrading of the source area? All right. So it looks like our trick question may have worked. OK. All right, it looks like I tipped it a little bit here. Um, so let's just go through those, those answers. So first, um, we wouldn't expect all fractions or chemicals because of just by virtue of the fact of partitioning, right? So um, some compounds, say the low aromatics, if they're present, are going to part partition out and not those um, couch potato high-range aliphatics. The, this, uh, this question was biased, potentially biased to discourage uh, low-range aromatics being the answer. First thing, um, we've only got EC8, so that's really just xylenes. Um, and there's a low proportion of, of um, in the, the NAPL itself. Uh, and then second, you've got biodegradation. So the smaller compounds do tend to be a bit more um, susceptible. So you wouldn't really expect a lot of low aromatics. Could it happen? Sure. So it's a likelihood question. High aliphatics, we already told you, they're not very soluble, not very, um, not likely to be in the water. Petroleum metabolites, sure. Uh, you know, once the NAPL is essentially, once the residual is all done with biodegradation, you wouldn't expect metabolites to stick around much longer. But, yeah, as long as biodegradation continues, you'd expect metabolites. So, great. Um, good, good job. And let's wrap this up. 
So you've already heard it. TPH is a complex mixture. The mass and composition of TPH changes uh, after release, and it depends on individual hydrocarbon properties such as uh, partitioning and susceptibility to biodegradation, as well as the geochemical processes and other conditions at, a, at the site. And understanding TPH risks is important. Uh, mass uh, and composition changes are important because that leads to our next section and how um, TPH risk can change at a site. So with that, I would like to introduce Diana Marquez. Um, she's a toxicologist with uh, uh, Burns and McDonald in Kansas City. And as I recently found out, she was involved with uh, the toxicity, aquatic toxicity testing for developing our TPH diesel salt water screening level. So thank you, Diana. Here you go. Thank you, Ross. So as uh, Ross mentioned, we're going to now start taking all the information that you've been hearing from everybody till now and applying that to actually performing the human and ecological risk assessment. So the things that we really want to focus on today is how you can use a tiered approach um, to applying both screening level and site-specific assessments to a human and ecological risk assessments at your site and recognizing how the unique analytical and fate and transport characteristics of TPH and the fact that it is a mixture, how those are going to affect your risk assessment. Um, we also want to look at whether or not your actual existing data for your site may be sufficient for doing your risk assessment or whether or not you might really need to go out and collect more. And ultimately, at the end of this, we want to gain an appreciation for what are the uncertainties that you're going to be facing when you're looking at doing a TPH risk assessment specifically at your site. So now, don't even make an attempt to try to read this graphic. The reason I have it in there really is to just give you kind of the big picture of what the whole thing is, but we're going to break it up in pieces over the next couple of slides. But this, this graphic is taken directly from the guidance document, and it really gives you a process for doing a tiered assessment, both human or ecological, for evaluating TPH risk at your site. And the first piece of this is a screening level assessment. So this would be really your tier one. and what this looks at is initially developing your preliminary CSM. And this is intended to be done with whatever data, TPH data, that you have available. If you are looking at a site that's already been under some form of investigation. So this is typically going to be your bulk TPH data. Now, if you're looking at a new release or something, then we would, we would suggest that you start off by getting bulk TPH data and evaluating that in comparison to bulk screening levels if they're available, or looking at um, what, whatever types of bulk comparisons that you can make, and using that as an initial step to, to getting a sense of what the site looks like. And this screening assessment really is your, your place to start, because not all sites really are going to require that you go past this. There may be sets of for circumstances where a screening level assessment is really all you need. Um, however, if your site either fails a bulk screening assessment or you have some sort of unique exposure pathways or some sort of site-specific circumstance that really warrants you diving into more of a site-specific site evaluation, then go into the next stage. And the next stage really is your, your what we would say, Tier 2 or Tier 3 site-specific steps. This is where you're going to go in and actually identify your data gaps, and most likely you are going to be collecting additional data at this point. This is where you may be needing to um, look at collecting fraction data. You'll probably be looking at potentially specific indicator compounds in addition to whatever bulk TPH data that you have, updating your CSM, and getting into more depth to look at the site-specific um, aspects of, of your, your particular project. So delving into the site-specific aspect of this, let's take a step back and look at the case study as an example. Things that we really want to focus on specific to a TPH risk assessment goes back to the concepts that you've been hearing from Mani and Rachel and Ross up till now, which is the fact that TPH is a complex mixture. And as a complex mixture, you have to deal with things like partitioning across media and the fact that different chemicals in this mixture are going to partition differently, like Ross just talked about, and the fact that this mixture changes over time. So 
when you're using the case study as an example of a CSM drawing, the, you can imagine that the concentrations of different chemicals across the plume do in fact change as they move across from the source down to the actual water body. And you have a potential for different, different rates of migration for different compounds. You also have to consider the potential degradation products, such as the metabolites that Ross spoke about. Um, other pathways are going to be very similar, and other aspects of the exposure assessment are, in fact, going to be very similar to a standard risk assessment. You just have to make sure that you're considering the aspects of, uh, that, that are unique to the fact that you're dealing with a mixture that, that does change over time and change over distance. So going on to a poll question, and you may recognize this particular graph from Mani. And Mary, if you could open the poll. Thank you. We actually have a couple of questions associated with this. And this goes on to, to think about our exposure assessment. So looking at these three chromatographs, on evaluating the differences between the three, looking at the first question is, looking at sample number one, what do you think the dominant exposure pathway would be? If you notice on this particular chromatograph, the compounds are really heavily focused on the light end of the spectrum. So this means that they're most likely very volatile based on what we've learned from, from Ross. And I can see that most of you have answered that the inhalation pathway is going to be dominant, which is correct. Now, looking at sample three, do you think that any exposure pathways could be excluded from this assessment? Now, on this particular that uh, sample, you've got compounds that are present all across the spectrum. You've got light range, middle range, heavy range, which means that you probably can't exclude the inhalation pathway because you've got compounds down here. You can't really exclude any of the direct contact pathways. So in my mind, the correct answer to this one really is none um, because you really do have compounds present all across the spectrum here. So let's talk a little bit about toxicity. Now, there really are three basic options for how you can assess toxicity in, in terms of the risk assessment when you're dealing with TPH. One is the way that we're all used to doing it, which is looking at the individual, what we would call you know, car target compounds associated with TPH. And that's your BTEX and your PAHs. And if you do that, you really are ignoring the rest of the TPH fraction in favor of just looking at those indi indicator compounds. Um, and that is one approach, and that is an approach that a lot of, that has been commonly used over time. And it may very well be perfectly adequate if you have a site that doesn't have a heavy presence of the non-assessed compounds like the aliphatic end of the range. Um, an alternate approach is to actually look at the risk associated with whole products. There are, there, there, you can derive RFDs for certain whole products, and there is data out there for that for some of these products. There are advantages and disadvantages to this in that some of the, 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 most of the data is based on fresh product. And if you have an aged release or something like that, it may not be directly correlate to, to what you have. But there is some information out there and toxicity data available for some, for some whole products. The third alternative is to evaluate risk associated with fractions. And what this really comes down to is that toxicity values have been developed for each specific fraction, aliphatic and aromatic. And this, these toxicity values, which are, represent really the non-cancer um, toxicity values, can then be used in a risk assessment. One thing to think about when you are going to do a risk assessment with TPH, and this is a, this is a challenge that we really do face in this evaluation, is that the toxicity values don't necessarily align with the analytical method. And this can really pose a bit of a challenge for us. What this graph is showing you is that the fractions of, of the, the carbon fractions that are picked up by the analytical methods, which are um, shown up here in the upper part of the graph, so looking at, this is the Massachusetts method that we're seeing right here. You can see that the green fraction is covering um, this length right here doesn't exactly necessarily line up with what we're covering down here under the toxicity value. So the job of the risk assessor really becomes doing the best 
that they can to align the data with the toxicity values. So there is going to be some interpretation that is going to be required when you get your data and when you're actually doing the risk assessment. So be aware that when you are working with fractions, there is going to be some interpretation that you're going to have to do because the numbers and the analytical methods don't always don't necessarily line up one to one. One thing, another thing to be aware of with regard to the toxicity values for the different fractions is that there can be quite a bit of variability of toxicity values across different programs. And this table is really an abbreviation of ta a table from the, the guidance document. And what I have here is an example of some of the toxicity values from the low aliphatic range. And as you can see, from the Texas, Massachusetts, and EPA um, and, the, and the TPH criteria working groups, there is quite a bit of difference, um, you know, orders of magnitude of difference in the toxicity values that are being, that, that are recommended for the same uh, carbon range. And so when you, uh, the risk assessor goes to select the toxicity values that, that are going to be used in the risk assessment, you have to make very certain that you are that you know what regulatory program that you're working in and that you are selecting the correct toxicity value for not only the carbon fraction that matches the data, but for the regulatory program that you're working in. So back to our case study. Um, this case study actually did a couple of different things in regards to the toxicity assessment. They worked with the bulk TPH data and used screening levels that were derived to match the bulk TPH data. But then with regard to the soil gas data, they actually went back and fractionated that. So they went back and derived toxicity values to match the fraction uh, for the soil gas data. So in terms of our case study, they actually used two different approaches for their toxicity assessment. I also want to touch a little bit on, on the toxicity assessment of metabolites. Now, this is really a challenge from a risk assessment standpoint. Ross and Rachel touched a little bit on the analytical challenges associated with, with metabolites and that they're just not a really advanced analytical methodology for it. Well, we face the same challenge from a toxicity standpoint. There is very limited toxicity data available for the metabolites, and consequently, we have some very limited options on how we can address them in a risk assessment. And it really kind of boils down to the four bullets that you see on this slide. Number first option is that you can exclude them from the evaluation. And that is essentially what happens if you use a, a silica gel cleanup on your, um, on your samples and the only data that you plug into your risk assessment is data that was based on a silica gel cleanup. In other words, if the only data that you're using is data that, that removes the polar metabolite fraction, then your risk assessment is excluding the polar metabolite fraction from it. A second option is to use the reference dose that was derived from the Rogers study that's cited here and is also cited in the guidance document. A uh, third option is to adopt the toxicity ranking model that was developed by Zemo et al. in their papers that were presented in 2013 and 2016, and there's more description of that in the guidance document as well. And a fourth option is to simply treat the bulk metabolites and the bulk hydrocarbons as basically being the same. And that is what you're doing if you don't do a silica gel cleanup and you essentially use all of the data um, as if the total, the TPH value that you, that you obtain from the lab without any silica gel cleanup is 100% hydrocarbon. Um, and that's an approach that's been adopted essentially, essentially that, that was a very simplified way of describing it by Hawaii and uh, California, um, San Francisco Bay Regional Quality Control Board. So uh, my final slide with regard to our case study is a little bit of the risk management aspects of it. And what they found was that their, their biggest concern ended up being vapor intrusion, uh, at least from the, from the human health standpoint. And so, they, uh, their way of addressing their, their overall site risk was they required a bit of vapor mitigation systems. 
Um, with regard to what direct contact risks they identified, they used asphalt cover. And then um, in order to avoid or to address CD acute safety or explosive concerns, they did end up requiring emergency hazard management plans. And now we're going to move on to humans because we are not the only creatures on the planet. We have, are going to start talking about some other critters that are out there. So I'm going to start off the eco-risk section with another poll question. So Mary, if you could open the poll. So for this poll question, we are going to consider that we have three different sites. Site A is a gasoline release site with the UST, and the site is 100% paved, and groundwater is 100 feet below. Site B is also a gas station release. It's got a paved, channeled groundwater discharge to a creek a half mile away. And Site C, continuing release from an oil refinery with both terrestrial and aquatic habitats nearby. Now, of these three sites, which one do you think would only need a screening level ERA? And most of you have picked Site A, and I can go along with that. You could even really argue that Site A might not need a risk assessment at all, an eco-risk assessment at all, but I can go with a screening level one there. And the next question, which site would be best addressed with a site-specific eco-risk assessment? That's Site C. I completely agree with all of you, so great job on those two questions. So an ERA may not be necessary under what sets of circumstances? Well, when you have no habitat. If your sites are completely paved, then you probably don't need to do an eco-risk assessment. Now, you might be thinking of you know, future circumstances and what have you, but if you have mechanisms for ensuring that, then um, you, know, you probably don't need to, to worry about an eco-risk assessment. If whatever contamination you have is below the root zones and burrowing zones, then you probably don't need an eco-risk assessment. If you have no releases to nearby habitats, again, probably don't need one. And before you can ultimately make these decisions, though, you do need to consult your regulations and, and guidance documents and make sure that, that such exclusion criteria are available to be used at your site. Now, a screening level eco-risk assessment, number one, your regulations or guidance documents have to allow it. Um, but you could go a lot down this path if you actually have good screening values available to be used. And if those screening levels are appropriate for use for your set of site conditions and the type of release. For instance, if, the, if your site and, and your products that are released to the site actually are consistent with the screening levels that are available. Um, and if you have the information that you need to do it. For instance, if you have bulk TPH screening levels and you have bulk TPH data, then go forward and go forth and do a screening level eco-risk assessment. Um, and at this point, you probably don't need TPH fraction data to do a screening level eco-risk assessment. Um, and, at, and since we're usually doing these as sort of a first step tier one kind of thing, you probably aren't going to have it anyway. And um, there are a couple of tables, 7, 12, and 7, 13 in the guidance document for different types of data that you may have available and that may be useful. Um, there's a couple of different places that you can go for actually for TPH screening levels for ecological receptors. And there's more description and far more details in the guidance document. Now. When would you want to go from screening level to site-specific eco-risk assessment? Well, first time, first and foremost, when you don't have screening levels or when you exceed them. A um, the second option is if your site is just it's a complex site, you've got multiple media, or you have sensitive habitats, or things that just don't fit the circumstance that the screening levels were based on. Or you have uh, data needs, and you have and, and you have the mechanism for gathering the data that you need, even for the site-specific risk assessment. Um, so if you have water soluble uh, and 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 you have the appropriate can gather the appropriate types of fraction data, um, then it may be appropriate if your site circumstances match to go forward and do a site-specific risk assessment. There is a separate set of tables in the risk assessment that discusses analytical data uses and needs for this, or in the guide section, yeah. So if you're going to go for site-specific eco-risk assessment, um, the things that you're going to focus on from an exposure standpoint are the direct exposures and 
if you, if the, from a bioaccumulation standpoint, you're really primarily going to look at the PAHs here. Um, toxicity assessment. There is data out there, or there you can look up data for both aquatic and terrestrial species. Um, this particular guidance document did not get into the issues of physical toxicity. Um, that's things like oxygen depletion and water and that sort of thing. But there are multiple approaches for evaluating chemical toxicity, and we'll get into that on the next slide. And as with the humans, there's uh, a dis emerging concern for metabolites, but there's still sort of limited available information. So doing the toxicity assessment or coming up with your toxicity values, you do have a few different options. One is uh, research literature, and there are pros and cons to each one of these options. Um, this, the, the, the ecotoxicity data, databases can be based on real world testing, which is good. But unfortunately, there just isn't a lot of information out there for the fractions or even for whole products. So that's the downside there. You can use structure activity models, um, but oftentimes you, this is purely modeled information, so that, that they're not tested and so or verified, so it's theoretical. Or you can actually do site-specific measurements. You can actually do toxicity testing, um, which Ross mentioned in the introduction was how that I had some involvement in developing the, the toxicity values that are being used, and we actually did toxicity testing for that or for some of those. Um, so the upside is that you're actually directly measuring the toxicity. The downside is that they can be sensitive to confounding factors or the possible presence of untested contaminants and various things like that. But the, the takeaway here is that you do have multiple options for how you can derive your toxicity information. The last thing I want to wrap up with and leave you all to think about is when you're doing a risk assessment, both human health and eco for um, TPH, there are not only just the standard uncertainties that you have to deal with with risk assessment, there are a few other things to consider. Um, some things to think about are like with your screening levels. Make sure that the screening levels that you use actually are consistent and representative of the TPH mixture that you have at your site. Um, make sure that you're considering and that you're avoiding things like double counting, for instance, if you're using a bulk TPH value and you're looking at indicator compounds, well, the, the indicator compounds are also present in your bulk TPH number. So you may end up with some double counting issues that, that could go on there. Um, make sure that you have accounted for, you know, any sort of, if you're, you're eco risk assessment, any sort of additional direct or indirect impacts from the TPH and basically just make sure that uh, your data and, and your fractions and components and surrogates are all representative of your site circumstances. And with that, I am going to pass this on to Usha Vidigari with AECOM. And Usha is a lead toxicologist at, at AECOM and is actually, I think this might be the third or fourth ITRC team that I've worked with Usha on. So um, Usha, it's up to you. Thank you, Diana. So after all this uh, technical information, we're going to spend just a few minutes discussing stakeholder considerations because if we don't consider them, a site is pretty much guaranteed to meet with delays and possible failure in reaching closure. It's that simple. So. Um, when we need to think of stakeholders, not just as receptors in the risk assessment, but as people who have a voice and a say in site evaluation and in site decisions. And when a stakeholder says, hey, there's all this black goop either on my property or right next door to me in the soil or in the water, it smells bad, it looks bad, I don't know what the health concerns are, if we don't address those concerns to that stakeholder satisfaction, we're just not doing our job right, and it's going to impact the success of the project. So in this um, section, um, we're going to go over who are stakeholders, um, some important aspects of communication with them, and um, talk about what stakeholder engagement tools are available 
and the guidance, and also provide some suggestions on how to approach some common sources of confusion and concern about TPH risk assessment that we hear from stakeholders. And there's a lot more detail on stakeholder um, concerns in Chapter 10 in the guidance document. So who are stakeholders? They may be property owners, they may be neighbors, they may be community organizations, they may even be local water utilities, fire departments, and so on. It's really anybody who has a voice and a concern about what's going on at a particular TPH contaminated site. They may not all have the same concerns. Sometimes their concerns might actually conflict with each other. But the important thing to remember is that they all need to be treated with empathy and respect. And when we are presenting to them facts and conclusions about TPH at a particular site, it has to be done in a way that is understandable to them and makes sense. And we've seen already from the foregoing presentations that TPH can be really technically complex. It can be quite difficult to understand. And so our job is to make sure that what we tell the stakeholders is something at the level that they can understand. So when, for example, if we are doing public notifications about sampling in somebody's backyard or in indoor air for TPH, it's not enough just to notify them. If we are going to provide them the data that we collected from their living environment, we can't just give them a bunch of TPH numbers. We need to explain what it means and how to interpret it. And in our um, Chapter 10, we provide a variety of tools for appropriate communication. Table 10-2, for example, provides a list of some um, technical terms that are TPH specific. And then it provides suggested plain English alternative terms that you can use when we are discussing uh, those issues with stakeholders. So an example would be, instead of saying LNAPL, we say fuel that is not dissolved in water. Or instead of volatile, we can say it evaporates easily. And so there are so many tools, fact sheets, you know, public meetings, ways in which we can reach out to people and make sure that we're explaining things in a way they can understand. So an example of a site where stakeholder engagement was done right is this case study that we have all been talking about, the tank farm redevelopment site. And as Jennifer pointed out, they actually started engaging with the stakeholders several years before the mediation began. And they built this relationship of credibility and trust. And as uh, Diana mentioned, they built their whole a response action plan around the stakeholder concerns, and so the project was able to move very smoothly towards closure and then on to redevelopment. So now I'm just going to cover some issues that are specific to TPH that often come up from stakeholders. One is about property values, and of course this often comes up on any contaminated site, but in particular for TPH site, what we find is that many times monitored natural attenuation is proposed as a remedy for a TPH contaminated site, and that means some residual TPH is left in the soil or the groundwater. And many times to stakeholders, it can look as though we are proposing a do-nothing remedy and that we're just walking away from the site with the, and leaving contamination in place. And at those times, it's really important to explain to the stakeholders that unlike many other chemicals, TPH can biodegrade naturally, similar to composting of organic matter, and MNA recognizes this fact. And the MNA option, we don't just walk away. It requires agency approval. Typically, it requires monitoring and documentation that biodegradation is occurring that concentrations are decreasing, so it can be a valid remedial option for some TPH sites. And if we don't take the trouble to explain all this, it leaves the stakeholder just filled with doubts and uncertainties and wondering whether their health and their interests are really being protected. 
some other technical issues that we often hear about um, at TPH sites. When we propose a risk-based approach to decision-making and site management for TPH sites, it's important to make it clear that we are only addressing a particular TPH source and release at that site for our decision making. Most people don't realize that there is a huge number of TPH sources that we are exposed to in our everyday lives. We're exposed to TPH from industrial products, consumer products, natural oils. It's there in paint thinners. It's in cosmetics. And so when we are proposing a risk-based remedy, we are not proposing to reduce exposure from all TPH sources for a stakeholder or a receptor. It's only from the source and the release that is the focus of our particular contaminated site. And so people need to understand that. Um, another concern we often hear about is um, fears about explosion and due to methane buildup because TPH does biodegrade and methane can be formed. And as the earlier speakers noted, um, <clears throat> the ITRC PVI guidance and also the ASTM methane standard actually are both really good documents that explain how methane concerns can be addressed. And I have worked on sites where methane was not an issue at a technical level, but we went ahead and collected additional data to show that biodegradation was occurring just so that people could feel more comfortable that methane truly was not going to be a problem at their site. Um, then we come to understanding what TPH data means. And that can be a challenge because by listening to all the speakers before us, we've come to the point where I think we can say that there is no one-size-fits-all TPH approach. Some sites were going to maybe take a very simple approach to TPH. Other sites may be a lot more work and a lot more data. Whatever approach we take, we have to make sure that the stakeholder understands why we took that approach for that site, why it is appropriate, and why it is protective of their interests and their health. That, and it has to be done in a way that they can understand. And finally, I'm just going to touch on nuisance concerns because it's an interesting thing. Um, TPH is one of those things where often you can notice the taste or the odor of TPH at concentrations that are much lower long before it's really at a, a level where there may be a health concern. But these are very legitimate stakeholder concerns because nobody wants to be drinking water that smells bad or tastes bad. And the approach to aesthetic concerns, like Jennifer said, is very variable across the country. There are some states like California and Massachusetts that actually have screening levels and they actually incorporate uh, how you address taste and odor concerns into soil management plans, for example, even if you don't remediate to those threshold levels. There are other states where aesthetics don't seem to be part of the guidance or the state's jurisdiction at all. And so it usually ends up being a case-by-case -case and state-by-state -state approach about how we deal with aesthetics. And there are many other issues like this that are um, specific to TPH that are listed in uh, Chapter 10, along with suggested approaches. But I just want to close by saying that no matter how brilliant our technical approach may be for TPH, the success of a project is assured only when we also have effective stakeholder engagement along with a good, sound technical approach for TPH. And with that, I will close, and I will turn this over to Jeff Kuhn for the closing. Jeff is a former long-term regulator from Montana DEQ with a lifetime of TPH experience. And actually, he is also an absolutely key driving force behind the creation and development of this ITRC TPH guidance. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Usha. I'm just going to show you a few slides to recap our presentation today. And then we'll go to questions and answers at the conclusion of this. So now that you've learned more about TPH, the question really is, how will you evaluate 
and apply this to your projects to determine what your TPH data truly represents. And most importantly, uh, in looking at your data, are you going to look at the chromatograms now? We spent a lot of time talking about chromatograms and what they mean. What about fractionating your TPH results? And if you use the silica gel cleanup method, how will you interpret that when you actually have a sense of what the degradation products are and, uh, and then what you want to do with that particular number? What about your CSM? We, again, we talked a lot about this uh, interpreting your data with, uh, with the CSM in mind. And when you're thinking about your, con your conceptual site model, uh, and especially looking at, at uh, older sites, you may find that you've got large data gaps that you had not considered. And maybe you didn't look at life cycle considerations, especially on an old site uh, where the data has significantly changed. And you open that back up and, and look at more recent data. So that may mean that you need to modify the CSM to integrate TPH. How are you going to do that? What about the metabolites? How will they affect your CSM? And then uh, most importantly, as all regulators know, the painful approach of opening up old sites. How are you going to approach TPH data at your reopened sites? And uh, in managing the Brownfields program, we dealt with this every day in my agency looking at old data, especially in larger sites, trying to understand what the bulk TPH represented and whether we needed to go back and resample and update the CSM. And in many cases, that's exactly what we needed to do to move the site forward and get it redeveloped through the Brownfields process. We talked a lot about the Hawaii case incident study and understanding the conceptual site model uh, Ross uh, talked a lot about where the source mass is located. And uh, again, if you remember the pie charts and looking at the different phases of, of contamination, uh, you can see the, uh, the source mass here, uh, the largest portion of uh, where the Elnapple plume was located, residual source, and then the Elnapple plume here. And, uh, and you can also see the different phases of contamination moving away from the site itself and eventually discharging to an aquatic habitat over here. So we spent a lot of time talking about the sources of gasoline and the diesel pipeline source and what that really means. And the take home message from this is for you to go back now, look at the sites, especially those sites that you're reopening and decide if you need to reevaluate the CSM and, and ask yourself the question, where is the source mass now at this site? And, and what do I need to do differently and perhaps when we close this site 10, 15, or 20 years ago, is there something else that needs to be done in light of the TPH data? And to recap some of Usha's comments, I always like to turn this around because to me the science was always easier than dealing with the stakeholder concerns. So the, the fir first and foremost going on to a project, especially an old site that we're reopening, where everybody in town knows, as Jennifer described earlier, there's oily goop in the ground. Uh, we need to seek and build trust and credibility with the communities that we work in. And often that means addressing not just real concerns, but the perceived concerns that all residents have. So we need to address potential health and ecological impacts. Uh, we've talked a lot about the PVI guidance document for vapor intrusion. And we need to look at the aesthetic criteria, especially with regard to any state or uh, there are quite a number of city and county ordinances regarding odor and visual complaints. So those are actually real ordinances on the books that we often have to address as project managers. And then the whole issue of potential property devaluation becomes really uh, a tremendous issue on some of these sites where the community talk involving a contamination problem that we go back and reevaluate becomes a great concern for those property owners who are near that plume site. And that's a real issue for folks that we have to help them overcome. And finally, we want you to use this guidance. And if you're asking yourself the question, where can I find help, we'd like to direct you uh, to, the, to some of the tools that are, that are available to use. One of the big tools we haven't spent a lot of time talking about are the online calculators in the document in Chapter 8. 
And also a very important uh, um, survey that we completed, and as well as the Hawaii case incident studies. Those three items are, are some of the more tangible tools that we completed as part of uh, producing the guidance document. And I just want to point this one state survey slide out to you because I thought this was very interesting to see. You'll notice with the colors in this particular uh, slide that um, wherever you're located in listening today, here's my state, great state of Montana, very cold today. We're surrounded by other states that do something very different than what we do. Now that picture is going to continue to change as time goes on and states consider what we have to say in this guidance document and other new information is developed. And uh, so the colors on this map will certainly change over time. But if you're looking for answers to some of these questions, we hope you'll consult some of your neighboring states and look at their approaches as well. It might be quite a bit to, to learn from them. And with that, that concludes our formal presentations. I'd like to turn this back now to Mary Yelkin for the final question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We do now have time for more questions and answers. In just a moment, I'll open up for our phone lines if anybody would like to ask a question out loud. You're also welcome to submit questions in the Q&A pod on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Before we wrap up, we have two more poll questions we'd like to get your input on. Also, just a reminder for those of you that need continuing education documentation, we would like you to fill out the feedback form. And then for those of you that do need that certificate of participation, at the end of that feedback form, there's a box you can click to certify you attended today. Once you do that and press submit, a certificate of participation will be generated for you. But with that feedback form, we'd like to hear from everybody today. This is the first offering of this brand new course from ITRC. And if you have suggestions from, for improvements, we would welcome those via the feedback form. So let's open it up to our phone lines. And remember, that is pound six to unmute. Any questions from our phone lines? We will go ahead and get some of our um, written submitted questions answered. And Diana, this first one came in, I think, towards the beginning of your section. And it says, if results are below screening levels, why would monitoring be necessary? Yeah, um, generally, you probably wouldn't need to do additional monitoring unless you have a, a, set, of, a set of circumstances where the, the, the data for your site or the, the product of your site is really um, different from the what was used as the basis for the screening levels that were developed, or if you have some unique set of exposure conditions at your site that is not addressed by the screening levels. So if you have some, for instance, the subsistence fissure type situations or things like that that warrant evaluation that aren't present in the screening levels, those would really probably be the, the only types of situations where you would need to do something beyond. Right, and here we have another question that says, are there any guidance documents on physical toxicity assessment? Shall I address that, Mary? This is Usha. Yes, go ahead. OK. So when we say physical toxicity for the eco-risk, we mean things like oiling, you know, where you might have an oil spill. And we've all seen pictures of birds with oil feathers, that kind of thing, uh, or fish eggs that are coated with oil. So in the guidance document, we actually have links to NOAA's websites and other um, agencies that have already published guidance on how to evaluate oiling and suffocation, smothering, those kind of effects, uh, which is what we're calling physical effects related to um, exposure to TPH. So the, uh, there's NOAA, and then I think there's also a couple international agencies that have published guidance on those. All right, thank you, Usha. Um, we did have a couple questions in trainers. I know you responded in writing to these, but I thought these would be a couple that would be important for everyone to hear. And this first one says, can regulators receiving TPH data assume that silica gel cleanup will be automatically performed when necessary, or must GC graphs and silica gel cleanup procedures be requested?
And Rachel or Ross, are you available to take that one? And remember, it is pound six to unmute. I can answer that one, too. If they're not available, yeah. they might yeah, have go gone ahead. back into their meeting. So in California, we are required to do it both ways, and you do need to request it specifically from the lab. You need to work, we need to work directly with the lab and say that we want it with and without silica gel cleanup. And we need to make sure also that we work with the labs in terms of what the reporting limits are likely to be and uh, how we want them to report the data in terms of the carbon range fractions that we want them to report. And we, ask, we should ask them to save the chromatograms and be ready to be able to discuss it in more detail if needed. All right, let's move on to another question. It says, would TPH risk assessment be necessary for a, his a historic subsurface release of cutting oil at greater than four feet below the grade with no VOCs and no TPH plume, provided the hydraulically recoverable L-napple is removed? Um, I'll answer that. This is Anna. It's, it's hard to say definitively without actually seeing any data. Um, but I, I, it's usually in those circumstances, or I shouldn't say usually, oftentimes in those circumstances, you don't need a, a site-specific risk assessment. Um, some sort of a, an evaluation of bulk TPH data in comparison to screening levels will often be sufficient. Um, but without actually doing that, it's, it's really hard to make a de definitive answer. All right, thank you. Let's go back to our phone lines, give them another opportunity to ask a question if there are any, and don't forget that it is pound six to unmute. All right, we had a question um, on the earlier time related to weathering process. And the person is wondering that if there is a way to determine the number of years that the weathering process has occurred over time. I don't know of a good way to actually determine the number of years, but this is a little outside of my area of expertise. And the person that's asking that question, I did just hear from Rachel and Ross, and they had to go on to another meeting, so they aren't an on to answer questions right now. But if you would like to send that question to training at itrcweb.org, we will do our best to get a response specifically to that question. All right, here's a question. Um, it says, we are cleaning up a UST site and they want to, they're looking to create a cleanup level um, that is unique to their situation. They're a tribe, and the, the land is still used for food and ceremonial purposes, and just wanting to get some input on how they should proceed. And I guess uh, just a thought on that, on this training, we're certainly not going to answer site-specific questions and would certainly refer you to the ITRC guidance document uh, to look for detail on that. But if any of the trainers um, would like to chime in in a general sense, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, on that one, I'm going to say that you'll, you'll, you'll want to actually have somebody, work with somebody to develop a site-specific cleanup level because the, the food and, and ceremonial aspects of your land use are unique. And I'm, I'm very familiar with the Kansas standards. I actually live in Kansas. And um, they don't cover those particular pathways. All right, thank you, Diana. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our phone lines. Do we have any questions before we wrap up today from our phone lines?
All right, we'll move on to another written question. It says, just wondering in your experience how mobile versus immobile NAPL should be assessed at a PHC site. <coughs> Hi, Mary, this is Mani. Let me take that question for Claire. Um, for mobile LNAPL, probably um, hydraulic removal using transmissivity is probably a, a, a good approach. For immobile LNAPL, um, we can probably use residual saturation, but you know, like more information is needed to kind of give a, a pretty good answer. And there is no clear-cut method, I guess, at, but at least to my knowledge. So. All right. Well, I think we have answered most of the questions either verbally or back to the individual in writing. If we have missed your question or if you would like additional follow-up, you're welcome to email us at training at itrcweb.org, and we will follow up with our trainers to get you a response. We very much appreciate the trainers taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us, not only on this, today's training course, but also over the two to three years that the team worked to develop the associated guidance document. So thanks to the trainers, and we look forward to having you on in future sessions uh, throughout the year of this same training class. So if you have colleagues that you think would value through participation. They can certainly access the archive, which will be made available after this training class, and probably it should be available in a couple weeks. Um, also, we have some live offerings coming up. Certainly, thank you to our participants for being on with us today and asking so many great questions that will help improve everyone's understanding on how to use this ITRC guidance document. For more information about ITRC, please check out the ITRC website at itrcweb.org.